Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Father, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to minister your word. Lord, we thank you for hearts to understand, ears to hear. Lord, for encouragement tonight, for anointing. We release anointing upon these children's ministers, children's ministry leaders tonight. Lord, refreshment. <laughs> Lord, just refresh them right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we open up our hearts for you, to you, to be used by you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's good to be here. And um, I was asked to speak on why do we minister to children? Why in the world would we minister to kids? Well, I believe there's a lot of reasons to minister to kids. I got started in children's ministry um, right out of Bible college. I did not set out to be a children's minister. Did you hear that? I did not ever set out to be a children's minister. I was the only child. I'd never been around kids in my life until my son was born. When he was being born, I was like, oh, my goodness, what am I supposed to do with this? Did not know. And um, so anyway, I learned, went to Bible college, went to youth min graduated out of youth ministry class, and thought I was either going to be a youth minister or a street evangelist. And I was neither. And I got and led us back to my hometown of Portsmouth, Ohio, and uh, wanted to get into the local housing projects in Portsmouth to do outreach, and well, actually, it was adult outreach I was looking to do, and went to the housing projects, and they said, well, we've never had preaching in the projects, never will, and I was like, whoa, I thought I heard from God here, so um, I was reading newspaper one day, and and. I saw where a professional baseball player had come back to Portsmouth, Ohio, and he had an anti-drug program going on. And back then it was say no to drugs. That was a big thing. Say no. Just say no. And then I, I really saw where that wasn't working. Uh, and it, you have to have something to say yes to so that you can say no to drugs. And um, so I went to the local, I went to that organization that he was with, and I said, you know what, I've got a program that says yes to Jesus so that you can say no to drugs because just say no isn't working very well and we have to say yes to something we say yes to Jesus and they said come on in so um, that was my um, first step out in children's ministry and we um, we went in we did our program and um, around a hundred children were born again the first the first time we did it and I was like it didn't that happen we went to the other house project around 100 more people were born again before long they were calling me saying can you please come do a program and um, so then we um, we saw where we could get into the local schools and do anti-drug programs and invite them back at night to to hear the gospel so I got a grant for four thousand dollars to get a first set of equipment. It was a far cry from this. It was a PVC pipe stage with with muslin stretched and painted on. And you can go on our website or on my Facebook page, and there's an album called History of the Jubilee Gang and pictures. You can see where we started with one little blue stage, and, and we built up over the years. Anyway, so we started going to the local uh, schools. First school we did had 250 kids in the school. We invited them back at night at the community center. 180 people came out. Almost all of them came forward to receive Jesus. And um, from there, we started um, sending out flyers to churches and letting them know that we are available to come. And it's just grown from there. And that was 25 plus years ago, something like that. So um, God's been good to us. And we didn't set out to be a children's minister, but we stepped through the door that was open. And that's where I think a lot of people miss it. They're looking for the big, let me be on stage, let me be in front of people, let me do something. And they never, and God's opening these doors. And we just never step in and step in. And I'm here and I'm happy to be here, okay? I don't really desire to be a pastor. I'm not saying I'll never be a pastor, but, I mean, I'm happy to be a children's minister 25 years later. Amen? And um, if you're in children's ministry, you are called to be here. And God can use So that's how I got started in children's ministry. I really didn't set out to. And uh, God opened that door. I stepped through it. And sometimes I wonder, God, why couldn't I just be a regular evangelist and walk in with my Bible and preach? You know, get on an airplane, fly, let somebody pick me up, show for me to my hotel, just with my Bible, Lord, just instead of all this stuff. And one day when I was complaining to the Lord, I heard in my heart this. He said, Jerry, what you're doing is precious to me. So in turn, I tell you, no matter what struggles you're going through in children's ministry, what you're doing is precious to the Lord. And be encouraged. 
and just know, you know what, um, God loves what you're doing. And um, he, is, he looks at us precious in his eyes. Well, why minister to children? Matthew 28, 19 says, go into all the world and make disciples. That is what it is all about, making disciples right there. Now, do we only make adult disciples? Do we? No. We make all age of disciples, okay? You know, it's not about all the cool high-tech children's ministry stuff that we can have. You know, we're, we got all the stuff, but it's not really about this, okay? Truly, children's ministry is about making disciples, our children growing up to look and act like Jesus. When you see them every day in, in adult ministry, it's the same thing. Are we making disciples? It's not about how cool our church is. I mean, it's, it's cool to have this. It's nice. It gets kids' attention, but it's not necessary. Okay, you know what? When I first started out, I had all my props on a table, one little blue puppet stage, one puppet, and we were still getting 100 kids born again in the housing projects. So all this isn't necessary. It's cool. It's nice to have. But are you making disciples? That's what it's truly all about. You know, I know some really big churches that have all the cool stuff. Man, I would dream, love to walk in and and have that as a children's pastor. But you know what? They're not turning out disciples. They're cool. They have all the nice stuff. But then I know some small churches that really they don't have the resources. They would like to have some nicer stuff, but they're doing the best they can do. But you know what? They're turning out disciples. Now, on the other side, there's big churches that are turning out disciples too. But why minister to children? It's about making disciples. Do they look and act like Jesus? I want to show you this video real quick. It's some children's ministry stats. And then I have some others that I want to share and just stir you up. Why is it so important that we minister to this generation? One stat that was on there about before a child turns into a teenager, I forgot what exactly age it said, but their worldview, what they believe about God, the devil, um, the, the Bible, heaven, hell, all those things are set in a person. Their worldview, how they view the world is set in them before they're a teenager. And um, it's very important. I mean, I think one of the greatest, one of the worst things today, I guess, is that Christians or people in our Christian churches really don't have a biblical worldview. And, and it's very important. What, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about the devil? What do you believe about heaven, hell, and the word of God? Is it really the word of God? A biblical worldview. And that's what our children, our, our families are lacking. And when I grew up in church, I, and I, my father was a pastor. I grew up in a Methodist Sunday school. And I came out of that Methodist Sunday school with probably a better grip on 
on the basics than what our children that are coming up in our cool, wild, crazy children's churches today. And I was like, wow, this is unique that we're on. We're at this place where now the people that are coming into our, our churches, really, they weren't raised in church. You know what I mean? They, they, um, they come in with all kinds of worldviews. Like when I die, I could be, I mean, I had children's, my children in my children's church, I believe when they die, they, they, um, their spirit floats around. Grandma's coming back and, and bothering them sometimes. And, and you know, my, my dog is going to be in heaven. And, and, I mean, all these different things, these worldviews. And I'm like, we really need to focus on, on presenting a biblical worldview in our children's churches. I want to go over some stats real quick and just why it's important to minister to children. Of the 5 billion people on earth today, these stats are a few years old. I don't know if there's more than 5 billion now. Of the 5 billion people on earth today, 50% are under the age of 15. In the United States, almost one-fourth of the population is under the age of 18. 40 million children in the U.S. have never been to church. Have never been to church. You know, back in the day, a lot of most, most people had been to church. Now, um, you, who's Jesus? Who's, um, who's Paul? Who's, who's the disciple? I, they don't know. They have no clue. And if they have been to church, it was on Easter or Christmas, and church was so dead, they really didn't see any relevance in it, and they never came back. You know, we've got to show them the relevance, why, why Christianity is the way. Are we living it? Are we producing disciples that truly have a biblical worldview? Two out of three children in the United States do not know Jesus. Two out of three. Eighty-six percent of all people who receive Jesus do so before the age of 15. The years prior to 12 are when the majority of people make their decision to follow Jesus. Billy Graham said this, the seven years old is the age a person is most receptive to the gospel. Seven years old. The probability of someone being born again in America in different ages are, are as follows. 35% between the ages of 5 and 12. 4% the ages of 13 to 18. 6% for those 19 and over. Percentages of people in America during different eras that believed basic Bible truth that Jesus is the Son of God, the Bible is the Word of God, were saved by the blood of Jesus and are born again. World, World War II generation, 65% were born again Bible-believing Christians. Baby boomer generation, 35%. Generation X, that would be me, 16% of my generation were Bible-believing born-again Christians. And this is the big one. And if nothing changes in America, when the children that are in our children's churches now become adults, only 4% will be Bible-believing, born-again Christians in America. We have to do something. I think the stats prove that we need to minister to children. We need to throw our finances, our resources toward this age of children. When I look at uh, the amount of evangelists that are in the world today, people that are called to be evangelists, most of them focus on adults. Yet the harvest for children to come into the kingdom of, God, the kingdom of God is ripe. They're waiting for us to come to them. Amen. They're hungry. Seven years old is the age most receptive to the gospel. Well, what does the Bible say about children's ministry? Well, it's very important that if we're doing something, it must be biblical, right? We don't want to go do something that's unbiblical. And um, if you open your Bibles up to... Um, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. This is what God told the nation of Israel to do. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. What does the Bible say about children's ministry? Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. 
These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you keep, as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you. And that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So I believe God feels it's very important to pass our faith on to our children. I um, see many churches that have experienced revival where God does awesome outpouring things, but they did not pass what they gotten from God to the next generation. It was all about what can God do for me. I'm, just get me blessed, Lord. Get, bless me, Jesus. And but you know what? The children sat on the back row or they left them at home or they put them in the back room and just let them color. And God had done great things in that church, but the next generation did not get it. We have to bring our, church, our kids in. We have to let them experience God with us. Amen? And there's a, there's a movement out, and I'll get into this more tomorrow, but there's a movement out where, where we're not separating our, their kids from in everything we do. And I'm not totally, that group is totally anti-children's ministry and anti-youth ministry. I'm not there, okay? But the children do need to see our, their parents worship God. They need to see the faith of their, their, their parents. If they don't, then it's just something that their parents believe. It's not really relative to them. If they don't see it lived out at home, you know, God told them to write it on the door frames Hang it on the mirrors. Do, do whatever you have to do to pa- talk about it when you get up, when you go to bed. Genesis 18, 19. God chose Abraham because of his willingness to train his offspring. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So because of Abraham's willingness to train his children, God chose him as his covenant partner. You know, if you look at the handout I gave you, there's all kinds of scriptures on there about including children in worship. When God told him, okay, when you go to worship, take your kids, take the little guys with you. When you go to, um, to um, when they bring the Ark of the Covenant in, take the kids, take the little guys with you. It's very important that we include our children. You know, Jesus spent a great part of his ministry ministering to children. It wasn't just an adult thing. He raised 12-year-old daughter of Jairus from the dead in Mark 5, 22 through 43. He cast devils out of two children in Matthew 15, 21 through 28. In 1418, you can look those up later. I think they're on the handout. That's why I had them on the handout so you can refer to that. He taught kindness to children, was rewarded by God, Matthew 10, 42. And I'm going to go ahead and read this one. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly, I tell you, that person certainly will not lose his reward. I know Willie George said it this way, if you give a kid a cup of cold cold Kool-Aid, you won't lose your reward. He said, you know what, for those that are changing diapers in the nursery, when you get to heaven, you're going to have this golden diaper, bless God, with a little golden turd in it. No, just kidding. Sorry. But we will not. Everybody say, I will not lose my reward. 
You know, when we bless kids, God rewards that. He taught his disciples to respect children and not to offend them, Matthew 18, 1 through 6. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like a little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever welcomes one such child in, the, in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be thrown into the depths of the sea. You know, God said that we need to become like little children. He didn't say little children become like us. You know, because if you tell a kid, hey, look, we're going to Mars tomorrow. We've got a spaceship out in the backyard. We're going to meet here at 5 o'clock in the morning. They'll get up at 4.30 and get, get over here and get ready to go because they believe what you tell them. Amen. That's why it's very important that we present the truth to children. Amen. We've got to make sure we're presenting a biblical worldview. We've got to, excuse the term, but we've got to indoctrinate our kids. We have to wash their little minds with the word of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How many here have ever renewed an old piece of furniture? You sand it down, you take it, and you, and you refinish it. And that's what we need to do to our minds. We need to refinish our minds with God's word. Take out the old junk, put in the new. In Matthew 19, 13, Matthew 19, 13 and 14, Jesus took little children in his arms and blessed them. Then Jesus brought the little children to Jesus. Then the people brought the little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as this. So Jesus valued children. Amen. He when he was ministering to adults, he encouraged children to come in and listen. He encouraged the children. He said, oh, y'all go in the back room and color and, and do your thing because we're ministering to adults here. And y'all might, y'all might be a little bit rowdy and you might disturb our service. And no, he said, come on in. Don't send them away. Let them be with us. God has ordained only two institutions to train children. Two institutions. First and foremost our parents. Did you hear me? First and foremost, our parents. Today, we, we have a serious situation where parents have dumped their responsibility. Fathers have dumped their responsibility off on children's pastors and youth pastors. Here, take my kid, be the cool guy, and get the respect and teach him the word of God. And let me work my job and, and, and pay for all the stuff and you all teach it. I heard somebody say that we as a church, on average, the average kid that comes to our children's churches, we only have 40 hours a year to teach them everything they need to know. Now, that's after holidays, that's after vacations, that's after the parents, that, the kids that are back and forth because the parents, want, they're with one parent one week and they're in church the next week and back and forth. Because of sickness and all that, if you add it up, and I, and I did this, the last church I was on, the, the top child was at church for 30, no, 49 weeks out of the year. Next, it went down to 36, and then it went down to 30, around 30, and then it dropped down to 25, and that's where most of the kids were at. 25 weeks a year, they were at church. Now, if you have two-hour services and an hour of that's teaching, around 40 hours a week that we have to get us what we're doing. If we don't get the parents involved... There has to be a shift. There has to be a shift. And I have more questions about this than I have answers. And I'm going to talk about more tomorrow. But, but we've got to get the parents involved. 40 hours a week is not enough to make a disciple of Jesus, is it? Uh, two hours a week compared to 166 or whatever hours a week that they're getting media, TV. If they're not getting at home what they're getting at church in more concentrated form, 
we will not produce disciples of Jesus. So we've got to start equipping parents. We've got to start equipping fathers to disciple their children. And we're there to partner with you. Okay, I know for years we, I, I thought, I mean, I'm, I'm here to lead these kids to Jesus. I'm here to disciple them. I'm here, and we are, but really it's, it's the parent's job, and we're here to partner with them. It has to be that way. I mean, that's the first thing that God set up was for parents to do it. Amen? Well, number two is the church. We're here to partner with parents in making disciples out of children. Jesus told the church in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. So it is the church's job to make disciples also, amen? But, however, it's number one, everybody say number one, the parents' job. So I don't know how that looks in each church. I don't know how that looks in this church or another church or my home church. Um, but we've got to start equipping parents to be the dis- disciplers. That's not a word, is it? Disciplers <laughs> of their children. There we go. Well, God has set ministries in the body of Christ for ministry to children. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 10 through 15. Ephesians 4, 10 through 15. He that descended is also that ascended far above the heavens, that he might fulfill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried away with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie to wait and to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ." Well, God set those ministries in the church, right? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors. And um, now we we would all probably agree that Jesus was the pastor, right? He was the good shepherd. Jesus was the apostle. He was the prophet, the teacher, all these things. So he gave parts of his ministry to different people. Didn't give it all to one. The new ministry called Apes, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist. (laughs) No, he didn't give it all to one. He put it in different, different people. So did Jesus ever minister to children? Well, I think we saw that. So if Jesus ministered, and that's why I can say, well, I know that children's ministry is ordained by God because Jesus ministered to children. And if he did that, he would have gave that part of his ministry to somebody. Guess who that is? That's us, amen. So you are called. You are in ministry, Amen. No single person received all of Jesus' ministry. If you are ministering to children, you are called and anointed to do that. Did you hear me? If you are ministered to children, you are called and anointed to do that. Do not look, let anyone look down upon you for ministering to children. You know, sometimes people ask me, so, so what do you do? I say, well, I'm a children's evangelist. Oh, like someday you'll get in real ministry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let me tell you, this is as real as it gets, folks. You know, I've done meetings with big-name speakers and big camp meetings, and I'm not bragging about myself, but I'm just saying the fruit. Almost every time we get more people saved, more people healed, more people filled with the Holy Ghost than the big guy. And um you that minister to children, you know how open children are. You present the truth, yeah, man, let me have it. You are anointed, you are called to be here. Why minister to children? Because we do not want to lose 
this next generation. Amen. Four percent is looming. That number is looming, and it's getting worse. I just talked to a friend of mine, Becky Fisher, the other day, and she said, you know, the, all the things that we predicted would happen back in around the 2000s is now coming to pass. And she says, I have to quit reading the stats because it's depressing. I, I mean, it's almost overwhelming at times. But it's not too late, folks. Amen? We have to do something. Do not lose this next generation. You'll find us laughing, playing, singing, and talking. You'll find us hurting, lying, fighting, and crying. You will find us in homes, in schools, and in malls. You'll find us in parks, on the street, and in churches. We are your children, your youth, and your responsibility. The call of the world continues to weaken the influence of our families and the church over us. It is becoming harder and harder for us to hear the message of God's love. The time is right for a decade-long emphasis on the children and youth of our world. We don't need another program. We don't need more events. Or church camps. We need a church that will minister to us and incorporate us into the church family through a wide variety of means and methods. We want and need opportunities to minister to others in ways consistent with our ages, development, abilities, and spiritual gifts. We are disciples in training, not disciples in waiting. Please don't underestimate us. We are the church of today and the church of the future. But you're in danger of losing us. You're 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 losing us. Will you do whatever it takes to reach us? Will you set aside your differences and meet us where we are? Will you teach us how to live? We are within your grasp. You can help change our lives. Please take time to share Christ with us. Because in 10 years, I'll be 28. In 10 years, I'll be 20. In 10 years, I'll be 17. I'll be 26. I'll be 21. In 10 years, I'll be 25. In 10 years, I'll be 16. I'll be 24. I'll be 19. I'll be 22. I'll be 25. I will be 23. In 10 years, I'll be 27. The question is. 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 In ten years, will you have made a difference? takes to make a difference will we make disciples of children not just have the coolest children's church in town or the, the one place where everybody wants to hang out with will we do what it takes to make a difference amen i believe we will because we love god we have his heart we want to follow what he's told us to do go make disciples of all nations i know some of us here are probably um, tired some of us are, on, man, I'm just ready to give up, you know. Maybe some have lack of resources, um, just struggles of ministry. You know, ministry can be a cold, hard place. It really can. But you know what? I just want to encourage you tonight to raise up, get refreshed this weekend, go back with a new sense of, man, I'm going to do what it takes to make a difference in the life of a child, because it really doesn't matter what our bank account is, what kind of car we drive, what house we live in a hundred years from now, but it will make a difference, the change that we've made in a child's life, or the impact we've made in a child's life, amen? I'd like for everybody to bow your head, close your eyes, if you're on struggling tonight, if you're feeling, man, I just, I came here just hoping to get something from God, and I'd like to pray for you.